When you listen to news reports about uh, the future of fresh water, you'll sometimes hear things like water will be the next gold. And that refers to this idea that fresh water is becoming increasingly scarce and it's going to get even worse in the future. And there's a lot of truth to that statement. Water is increasingly scarce in many parts of the world and climate change is going to make that problem more challenging. But even with that kind of dire future uh, to look at, there are some good pieces of good news in the global freshwater cycle. So in this video, we're going to get started by actually looking at how um, water is distributed across the planet, how it moves, and exploring some of the fundamental scientific concepts that you'll need to talk more about freshwater. The first thing that we'll talk about in this video is where water is found on Earth. And this is crucial for understanding what parts of the water cycle we actually can use for human activities and what parts are functionally unavailable to us. By the end of this video, you should understand two fundamental scientific concepts. The first is flux and the second is residence time. These two concepts are also important for understanding the use and overuse of water. And this leads to the third part of the video, which is that you should be able to explain how these concepts of flux and residence times can be used when you're talking about or predicting the future of fresh water. The old saying is that an image is worth a thousand words, and that's especially true if you look down at the Earth from space. 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by oceans, and in the image here from NASA, you can see that clouds make up the water vapor swirling across the oceans and across the continents. And you can imagine the rainstorms that are occurring underneath those large tropical storms, like the tropical cyclone approaching the coast of Mexico in this image. If you look on the continents, you see areas of brown where water is scarce and areas that are green where water is more abundant. And when you see a picture like this, there should be no question in your mind that water determines where life occurs on the planet. And if you ever find yourself floating in the middle of the ocean in a rowboat looking for something to drink, you also know that despite all of that water everywhere in this image, it's not particularly useful to us if it's salty. One of my favorite views on the planet is from a window seat on an airplane on a transatlantic route from the US to Europe. On a good day, about halfway through that flight, you can look down and see giant glaciers and massive ice caps covering Greenland. And before and after that, you look down and all you see is the ocean. This is the other place where a picture, and this one from a NASA flight, can tell us an awful lot about where water is on the planet. Much of the water on Earth is in ice, if it's not in the ocean, and that is another crucial um, fact for the future of fresh water. If we look at the data on water distributions in this image from the U.S. Geological Survey, we can get a stark view of just how little fresh water there is on this planet. Most of the world's water, over 97%, is either in the salty oceans or in the salt-rich inland water bodies in places like the Great Salt Lake in Utah, or in shallow salty water aquifers under the ground. That leaves only 2.5% of the Earth's water in a form that we could actually survive on. And if we take that massive 2.5% and we break it out further, we find that 70% of that remaining water is in glaciers and ice caps, 30% is in groundwater, and only a little over 1% is in surface water, including rivers, streams, and lakes. Break up that tiny 1% even further, and you'll find about 70% of the 1% is in ground ice and permafrost. And that little tiny residual that's left is what we typically think of when we think about where we, our water comes from. If this tiny fraction of 1% of water was where the story ended, we'd be in trouble. But fortunately for us, water moves around the Earth in many different forms. And so what we use has much more to do with how the water flows across the Earth through the biosphere, through the atmosphere, than it does to do with how much water is sitting in some place like the ocean. And this brings us to two key concepts or definitions for understanding um, any of the biogeochemical cycles, and those are called fluxes and reservoirs. A flux formally is the transfer of molecules from one reservoir to another over a specific period of time. We can have fluxes of many different substances, including carbon, nitrogen, or in this case, water. A flux of water is actually what you see when you look at a river. A river is carrying surface water from one reservoir to another. Now, when we say reservoir, in this case, talking about water, we simply mean a location within a biogeochemical cycle where an element or compound is stored. Um, now, for water, it could be an actual reservoir with a dam and a big pool of water piled up behind it, but it might be something else. 
Now, the reason this matters is that we as humans survive on both fluxes and reservoirs. And in the case of water, we do often depend or mostly depend on regular fluxes in the form of rainfall or snowfall to replenish our supplies so that we have usable water when we need it. The other key scientific concept that you need to know for both hydrology and other biogeochemical cycles is called residence time. The residence time is the average time that a water molecule, in this case, spends in a reservoir. And there's a simple way to estimate residence time, at least when inputs are equal to outputs. So let's work through this in an example. I think a good way to imagine this is a bathtub filled with about 400 liters of water, where you have a faucet running at about two liters per minute, but the drain is also open, so you're losing about two liters per minute as an output. It should be, I hope, intuitively obvious here that the water level is not gonna go up or down. If inputs equal outputs, then the reservoir size is the same. Doesn't change over time. What residence time lets us do is ask how long the average water molecule actually spends in the reservoir. The answer to that question um, is the size of the reservoir, in this case 400 liters, divided by the flux rate, which is in this case two liters per minute. And then and because the inputs and the outputs are the same, you can use either of them. The liters cancel out in this division and you're left with minutes. And so the answer is 200 minutes, which means that an average water molecule in the bathtub is there for about 200 minutes. Now you might be asking like, why do I care? So let me give you two examples. First, let's say you have a really nasty roommate who pours some obnoxious perfume in the water and you have to figure out how long you need to run the faucet before the water is completely flushed. And the answer would be about 200 minutes. A more relevant example is that this kind of calculation gives you an estimate of how long the reservoir will last at a specific rate of use. Let's say you were depending on your bathtub being filled with water as an emergency source of water and you were using two liters per minute. That bathtub water supply would last about 200 minutes. Let's look at some real world examples on the next slide. The figure here is taken from a publication in the scientific journal called Science. And it shows the global hydrologic reservoirs in the white boxes with the large numbers and the key fluxes that matter for the global water cycle in the little numbers alongside the arrows. As we talked about earlier, most of the water is in the ocean and in glaciers. But as you can see, there's a lot of water that moves back and forth between the atmosphere and the oceans or the atmosphere and the land. Our residence time calculation is really quite useful here because we can take the size of the oceans, for example, divided by either the inputs or the outputs, and we get an estimated residence time of water in the oceans of about 3,000 years. The reality is a little more complicated than that because the oceans are more complicated than that, but the point is basically correct. It takes a long time, thousands of years, for water to move um, through the ocean. In contrast, if we look at the atmosphere and we divide the total amount of water vapor over land and sea, by the fluxes either into or out of these pools, again over land and sea, we get 13 cubic kilometers of water divided by a flux of about 500 cubic kilometers per year, and that gives us about 0 0.025 years, or about 1.3 weeks. This isn't perfectly accurate, but it's a pretty good ballpark guess for how long water stays on average in the atmosphere. And that's usually about two weeks or so. And that's really important because the fluxes that we depend on, like rainfall or snowfall, are part of this process of rapid water movement into and out of the atmosphere. And if you look closely at the figure, you'll see that much of that process is supported by the water that evaporates out of the ocean and then is transported over land, where it then falls as rainfall or snowfall. Later on, when we talk about climate change impacts on drought and rainfall, these types of processes actually become central to a lot of the changes that we're seeing in the global hydrologic cycle. There are a couple of take home messages from a human perspective um, from looking at the global water cycle this way. First is that we depend on some key water fluxes, including rainfall and snowfall, um, and then on land, things like river flow. And these fluxes um, provide water for use in human cities or agriculture. So for these fluxes, sustainable water use means that we have to keep our demand below the rate of supply or the flux rate. As we'll see later, the rate of supply does vary year to year and from place to place. Now, there's another key point, and we'll talk more about groundwater in a different video, but this is the one reservoir instead of a flux that we rely on extensively as humans. 
And the issue with groundwater, as we'll discuss later, is that it has a very long residence time, which means that it takes a long time for water to fill into the groundwater reservoirs. And so if we wanted to use groundwater sustainably, we'd have to use keep our use or our outputs at a rate that is lower than the natural recharge of groundwater. Unfortunately, in many parts of the world, we're using groundwater much faster than it's naturally produced, and we're actually depleting this source of water. To summarize some of the key points from this video, the first big message is that most water on Earth is in forms we cannot use directly, and mostly in oceans and ice. The two definitions we talked about here are fluxes and reservoirs. We also talked about how you can calculate residence time if you take the reservoir size and divide it by the flux, assuming that the inputs and the output fluxes are the same, and in, by definition, the reservoir size is constant. Lastly, these concepts are important because we depend on fluxes like rainfall to provide much of our human demand for water. When fluxes are low because of drought, we can run out of water, at least temporarily. We also rely on reservoirs, and in particular groundwater, and if these reservoirs are used faster than they're replenished, then they'll eventually be used up. We're going to talk more about these issues in the next video.